I'm Richard Mays with Betsy Lauren, and our subject this time is collecting overdue accounts. Using this to bring in this. Let's think for a moment about your company's accounts receivable department and how it relates to you and to everyone else who works there. Unless most of a business's accounts receivable are received, payday for everyone could be in jeopardy. Is this John Allen with C&D Enterprises? And that makes the people who sit at the telephones collecting overdue accounts key individuals within your organization. I'll call again when he's in. Thank you. Do you see this work as a challenge? You bet. It's an important job. Someone has confidence in me or I wouldn't have it. And it's important not just to the company, but to the customer, too. Customer. The most effective collection representatives think customer. They remember that the customer they're talking to is the one everybody in your organization, management and design, production workers, salespeople, office personnel, shippers, Everybody working together has helped to win away from the competition. The customer. Tied to your company now by a single line. Yeah, this is John Allen, C&D Enterprises. Yeah, my secretary said you might call. Mr. Allen, the reason I'm calling is your firm. Will the customer still be a customer when you've completed your call? Your attitude may determine whether the answer will be yes or no. The best attitude to maintain is a positive one toward yourself and your work. You should also feel that you are a key member of the team, a valuable player who must come in contact with customers on a one-to-one -one basis every day. Your attitude is important when dealing with customers, even those who haven't been able to pay their bills. But it's important that your attitude toward customers is one in which you intend to be helpful, as helpful toward them as you expect them to be toward you. A positive attitude will go a long way in making the call successful. I agree. In most situations, people will do what you expect them to do. Whether you're new at collections or an old hand at this job, you need pre-call planning before you call. Next to a positive attitude, pre-call planning best determines how you'll proceed and how helpful you'll be. Pre-call planning starts with a review of the delinquent account. A thorough review will make your call that much easier. If it's a first call, start a call record. It's important to use a mature, business-like tone of voice. Listeners are turned off by a high-pitched sing-song or rapid-fire shotgun blast delivery. Is this Boyd McCaskey of Empire Rentals? This is Carolyn Carlisle of Space Savers Corporation. I'm calling about your firm's account, and it seems... She might have said, hello, Boyd, this is Carolyn at Space Savers. But remember, this is a business call. Using first names only may be considered pushy, and in some instances, may not even be legal. That's an important point. Laws concerning collection practices vary from state to state. We assume your employer has reviewed with you the rules and regulations you must comply with. But the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act of Congress is specific about telephone identifications. Basic to the law and to good techniques is to make sure you speak to the right person. Verify the name and address or company affiliation first. You must not discuss a debt on the telephone with anyone other than the debtor. In the case of a company's overdue account, you must speak only with the person authorized to make payment. It's the law that you must identify yourself. You cannot claim to be an attorney if you are not, nor pretend to represent any firm other than the one you work for, the company to which the debt is owed. May I say something? Certainly. By now you've gathered that your job is covered by legal thou shalt nots. Familiarize yourself with them. Know the law. For the remainder of this program, we'll assume that you do, as we suggest useful techniques within the guidelines set by Congress. We urge you to discuss with your supervisor whether or not a technique also conforms to local regulations and whether you're free to use it. Mr. Larry Davis of 142 Providence Road. Mr. Davis, this is Dan Palmer of the Leatherbacks Book Club. 
Have you received our latest information about home improvement tips? It's often assumed that a collection call is made just to ask for money. No, the successful collection rep always asks for information. The best way to achieve this is with open-ended questions, the kind that begin with who, what, where, when, and how. Who said you could skip a payment? What is the specific problem with the typewriter? Where did you return the shoes that didn't fit? When will the bill be paid? How can we reach an agreement that will satisfy everyone? The reason you ask for information is to find out how you can help the customer and to give an opening to tell you, directly or indirectly, why the bill remains unpaid. Having asked, then, listen. The reason for the delay in payment might be buried under the response to your request for information. For example. Oh, the doll came all right. Too late for my granddaughter's birthday. I ordered it six weeks ahead of time and then had to buy something else. And I thought, if they're not in any hurry, why should I be? I could put it away for Christmas. Oh, I am sorry, Mrs. Wethin. But you do intend to keep the doll? The right response comes naturally from having heard the disappointment, the frustration, even the vindictiveness of the customer and being sympathetic to hurt and anger which you didn't cause. Our records show that we mailed a notice that the doll was back ordered and we never got a cancellation from you. Maybe it got lost in the mail. But if you still think your granddaughter would like the doll... I didn't know I was supposed to cancel. And uh, now I've lost the papers that came with it. I have the amount right here, thirty-one ninety-seven, including shipping and handling. If you sent us a check today, you could have some of your Christmas shopping out of the way already. Listening nearly always provides a clue as to how you can be helpful. Well, I'm sorry you had to call, but as a matter of policy, we can't make payment unless the invoices are in order. Hmm. So would you please send us a copy of the invoice dated July 6th in the amount of uh, $10,021 so that I can authorize payment? It'll be in the mail today. When you listen, you won't always hear an answer as easy as that to respond to. If a product is defective, if a service was improperly performed, or if something was damaged in shipment, then you must have ready answers for what you'll do to help correct the situation. And, and having ready answers means your pre-call planning has prepared you for any kind of complaint or excuse you can imagine. No, I am not satisfied. You want to know why? No instructions. 10,000 little pieces to put together and you leave out the instruction book. Really? I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Miller, I'm going to dial our customer service department and get those instructions sent out to you by express mail. What's the model number of your kit? You didn't cause the complaint, but you are the ears of the company. Since the complaint isn't your fault, it should be easier to be a sympathetic listener. But even if it is your fault, it's still important to be sympathetic. The sympathetic response may be the single most effective ready answer you can have, but be prepared to follow it up with a solid solution to the customer's problem. If you'll return the package to us, I'll alert our shipping department to cancel the billing and reship and rebill when the broken item comes in. Will that be satisfactory? You're right. There was a quantity discount in effect when you ordered. I'll notify your sales rep of the error on the invoice and ask our accounting department to issue an amended billing. I'll put a tracer on those parts shipped directly from the factory right now. If you make a promise, note it on your call record, and keep the promise. Make sure you do everything you told the customer you would do. By now, I'll bet you're wondering, when is he gonna get to the hard part? To the tips on ready answers for some of the toughest customers, the stallers. I don't do anything about it. My husband writes all the checks. You've got the wrong Don McAfee. His bills and ours get mixed up all the time. The check is in the mail. The car's a lemon. I'm not going to put another dime in it. I haven't got the money. We can't pay. We've just declared bankruptcy. There are ready answers to these hard cases, most of them requiring you to be polite but firm while asking for additional information. 
In some cases, you may even have to impart information to the customer. Let's take a look at some effective ways to handle stallers. I don't know anything about it. My husband writes all the checks. Your husband will be home at 7 this evening? Yes. I'll call him then. You've got the wrong Don McAfee. His bills and hours get mixed up all the time. Well, I'm afraid that's not the case this time, Mr. McAfee. You said you live at 946 Sunset, and that's where the merchandise was delivered. I also have a signed receipt from a Mary McAfee there. That wife of mine, she didn't tell me. The check is in the mail. Oh, good. Now, may I have the number of the check, the date on which you wrote it, the amount, uh, and the address to which it was sent for my records? I'll be happy to wait. You misunderstood me. I meant the check will be in the mail today. Well, fine. Uh, fine. And I'll make a note that the full amount, $67.50, will be in the mail today, the 31st. And I'll tell our accountant to look for your check in the next delivery from the post office. The car's a lemon. I'm not going to put another dime in it. I'm sorry to hear that. No wonder you're upset. Have you taken it in for all the warranty checks? The warranty's expired. That's awful, Mr. Decker. However, your problem is with the dealer, or maybe the manufacturer. In the loan agreement you signed with the bank, the vehicle can be repossessed if a payment isn't made by the 10th. Is there any way we can work something out? Polite but firm means sticking to your guns. If everything you've learned indicates your business is in the right, and if you suspect a customer may be in the wrong, trying to wheedle concessions to which he or she is not entitled, continue to state the terms originally agreed upon and what your company's recourse will be. But be absolutely honest. Do not say the merchandise will be repossessed unless it will be. Do not say you intend to sue unless that is your intent. Do not say you intend to turn the account over to a collection agency unless that will be your next course of action. A sympathetic response is always better than a threat. Threats may be illegal and can often backfire. If they feel harassed, customers may bring action against you. But we were talking about ways of being polite but firm. I haven't got the money. You mean you're short of cash today. Will you be paid soon? I'm out of work, my unemployment has run out, and I haven't got the money. I see. Well, I don't want to make things worse for you. Uh, just a thought, though. Uh, do you have a relative that you can turn to? Only your supervisor can let you know what concessions to make in cases of genuine need. You must know what these concessions are and be ready to negotiate what your supervisor allows you to negotiate. These are policy decisions that vary from organization to organization. Continue to be sympathetic and, if possible, offer avenues for getting the account settled. Perhaps the unpaid balance can be spread out in smaller payments or some other agreeable arrangement can be made to help people make good their debts. Customers will be grateful to you for your understanding and will retain their loyalty to the firm once the crisis has been resolved. We can't pay. The utility bills have been so high, and we can't let them go. We're afraid we'll be cut off. Mrs. Dean, are you aware of the Warm Hearts Fund? It helps senior citizens on fixed incomes pay their winter utilities. Now, if Warm Hearts could help with those bills, you'd have no trouble with this account, would you? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> I'll look up the Warm Hearts number for you right now. Thank you for your kindness. Glad to help. Believe it. Customers don't forget people who respond to them as people. Even in the most unpleasant situations. We just declared bankruptcy. That must have been a painful decision. But since it's been made, I'll need your bankruptcy case number and the name of the attorney who's handling it for you. J203, Mr. Clinton. Oh, and could you do me a favor? Could you send me a copy of the bankruptcy notice? Yes. Good. I'll be looking for it. And I am sorry. You've been a valued customer. Thank you. Be sure and flag your call report so that you do not get in touch with a declared bankrupt again. To do so would be in violation of that person's rights. But problems like these will be only a minor part of your job. 
If you keep a positive attitude toward yourself and the customer, make sure you do your pre-call planning. And follow these simple techniques. Speak to the right person. Identify yourself accurately. Know the law. Ask for information. Listen. Have ready answers for customer problems. Lend a sympathetic ear. And be polite but firm in creating a solution to the customer's payment problem. It all adds up to maintaining control. Because when you're in control, you demonstrate those skills that make you a key employee to your organization. Good. You've said you'll send the full amount today. As soon as I get it, your account will be marked paid up. And you can have the use of your credit card again. And thank you, Mrs. Morgan. We appreciate your business. Keeping the customer, keeping accounts paid up. And keeping your own company in a position to pay its bills are goals to feel good about.